I'd like everybody uh, to uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Marinda Wu uh, back to campus uh, virtually uh, today. So uh, Dr. Wu earned her PhD uh, in inorganic chemistry here at UIUC in 1976, and her advisor was uh, Professor Russ Drago, very well known to many of us for this book, <laughs> Physical Methods uh, for Chemists. So even if we didn't know Russ personally, we know his book. Um, Marinda has more than 30 years experience um, in the chemical industry, mostly at Dow Chemical Company, uh, in research and development, also Dow Plastics Marketing, uh, also with small chemical companies and startups. She started a uh, Sciences Fund uh, organization to engage young students in science and enhance public support for science um, education. Uh, she's been a member of the American Chemical Society for more than 40, uh, 50 uh, years <laughs> um, and has served in many uh, leadership roles at the local, uh, local and national levels. She was elected to the ACS Board of Directors in 2006, served on the ACS Board through 2014, and was ACS President in the year 2013. Currently, she serves on the UIUC Chemistry Alumni Advisory Board and is the Chair of the Board of Directors for the Chinese American Chemical Society. Uh, Dr. Ruho se seven U.S. patents has written extensively on many topics, including a chapter for a polymer textbook, many journal articles, and has co-edited three ACS symposium books. So thank you, Marinda, for joining us today to tell us about your personal professional journey. Uh, we're very grateful for your willingness to share your story uh, because we realize that today more than ever, students want to see a role model, someone who's like them, and see how that person has succeeded uh, so they can see a path uh, forward. Um, we, uh, we want to thank you again coming back uh, to your alma mater and, uh, and supporting our Asian American and Pacific Islander students today. And with gratitude, the floor is yours. I'm very happy to be here today and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, but I really wanted to help celebrate Asian American Pacific Islanders heritage, which we've started to hear about just more recently these last few years. And so I'm here today to share with you my story, which I call Partners for Progress and Prosperity, a Personal and Professional Journey. So ACS was founded in 1876, 145 years ago. And we have basically about 155,000 members, kind of fluctuates whenever they do the surveys, but we've got 32 technical divisions for chemists in all kinds of areas. All right, so this was a slide that I was trying to show that ACS was founded in 1876, 145 years ago. But it's, it's got about 155,000 members all over the world with 32 technical divisions. So many of our members are active in particular, uh, their, their fields of specialty. Um, we've got 185 local sections spread across the United States with about 1,500 student chapters in the, in the domestic um, country, our country. But we are definitely growing globally. One of the reasons I ran for president is I feel that this is a global chemistry enterprise. So when I was um, first elected, we had only seven international chapters. And we did start the eighth one in Romania when I was president. But we have steadily uh, worked with international activities and the international um, uh, community of ACS. And we now have tripled the number of international chapters. In fact, we have lots in Asia. I can go through that if we have more time. And before we had zero international student chapters, but it's amazing. In the last eight years, we now have almost 90 student chapters overseas. We have about a quarter of our members now live outside the US. So the ACS has definitely become much more global. Can you see now this slide as on the ACS vision and mission? Yep, we see it. Great. Our vision has always been improving people's lives through the transforming power of chemistry. And our mission is advancing the broader chemistry enterprise and its practitioners for the benefit of earth and its people. Now I'd like to share my story of Pasadena versus Beijing. Both of my parents were born in Beijing, the capital of China, um, years ago. But they studied hard and were good students. 
So they both got scholarships to come to do their graduate work in the US. My dad came in 1945 to get his PhD at Caltech. And my mother came to the University of Illinois, which was, um, so I'm very happy to be second generation with Illinois. And she came in 1947, a couple of years later. Now they didn't know each other when they came to the US, but their families knew each other because my two grandfathers were actually good friends back in Beijing. So word spread in the family contacts. My dad learned that my mother had come to America. And back in those days, there were not many um, Chinese in America. So dad looked up my mom and courted her long distance, California to Illinois. I must have been, well, there was no email back then, <laughs> letters and, and phone calls, maybe, I don't know, but he did go visit her. And they decided to get married in 1949, actually on, in, on the campus of UIUC at the little Methodist church that is still there. The last time I came to Illinois, well, actually, maybe that was not the last time, but one time when I came, um, the dean brought me over there to, to take a look at the little Methodist church where my parents were married. And then in 1950, my dad finished his PhD and actually bought the boat tickets to return to his homeland. So, yeah, and that's where destiny and fate, a lucky twist of fate, because the Korean War broke out in the summer of 1950. And my mother was so pregnant with me that they decided it was too dangerous to cross the Pacific Ocean. So they ended up deciding to stay in America. And one of the family traditions for the Lee family was they often named their children after the city they were born in. So I've always been very happy to be named Marinda Pasadena Lee because that's where I was born in Pasadena. And it, I just don't even wanna think about if they had made the trip. I forgot to mention that it was actually not easy to travel in the early days. They had to take a boat to come to the US. And it was such a long, horrible two week journey that many people got seasick and ended up throwing themselves overboard to end their misery. So I've been again, very lucky. I feel my entire life because neither of my parents got that seasick, thank goodness. Anyway, when I was young, I always wanted to, I dreamed of becoming a scientist when I grew up. And later when I was in high school, I also thought about becoming an ambassador because I love learning different languages, learning about different cultures. And you'll see the theme throughout my life. Um, I ended up actually being very glad to major in chemistry and did well. I went to Ohio State and ended up being able to combine my, the two dreams of my youth later in life. So my undergraduate experience at Ohio State actually was quite foundational. I mean, it actually, when I think about it, it really helped me later in life. I lived in three totally, diff three totally different worlds and I learned to be able to slip in from one world to the other very easily. Um, I was definitely an OSU chemistry geek. I spent a lot of time when, uh, doing research, wearing white lab coats. And I had a wonderful research professor, Devon, Professor Devon Meek, who um, you know, started me in inorganic chemistry research. I spent my first year actually on campus working for the analytical chemistry lab as a freshman, helping them with titrations for their standards. But later, you know, actually did research starting uh, the summer of my freshman year, after my freshman year with an NSF grant and continued research for the next several years so that I was able to actually present um, my research and publish as an undergrad. But I also was very active on campus just as I was in high school. I joined a sorority my very first year and my, my best friends from college are still friends from my sorority. Um, I was active on campus and various activities. Um, and 
the, the OSU, of course, was big in football. And even though I, uh, um, anyway, I did, I was active with Block O. But the third group that I was uh, spent a lot of time on was the Chinese Student Association, because I had grown up, my father was a very successful professor in first Troy, New York. And so I went to elementary school there, but later years in Ohio. Um, so I didn't meet a lot of Chinese, except for my own sisters, my own siblings. And were the only, there was no diversity in my high school. Um, and so it wasn't until I got to college that I got to meet some other Chinese students. And I tried to find my roots by taking my extra, the electives outside of the science um, and, and chemistry curriculum, the, um, <clears throat> some courses on having to do with China, Chinese history, Chinese art, Chinese literature, just to learn a little bit more about my roots. And I find that the older I get, the more I'd like to learn more about my roots. And so this is part of the um, AAPI theme. I mean, we all come from somewhere and we need to learn to appreciate the diversity, which I totally championed and celebrated when I was president. And then at, when I graduated from college, my parents sent me on my first trip out of the US. And boy, was that eye-opening. It was the most fun trip I ever took, but also very interesting because for the first time, I started to get more of a global perspective, a, a totally different perspective from the American perspective. And I learned very quickly from joining the Chinese Student Aid CSA that I was an ABC, an American-born Chinese. And so there were a lot of stereotypes, you know, for ABCs. You know, they thought you were really wild. And actually, my parents raised me very Asian. The um, things that, you know, the Asian culture appreciates. And I have always helped thought that we need to appreciate all the different, the, the good parts of every culture. So anyway, let me hurry on to some of the other slides since we need to, um, you know, we can talk at the end with the Q&A. Graduate school. Well, I only applied to two graduate schools, both great schools, University of Illinois and UC Berkeley, because I wanted to go on and get my PhD in inorganic chemistry. But I was again, very fortunate that I was offered a three-year fellowship the, uh, from the chemistry department at University of Illinois. So that plus the fact that I wanted to work for Professor Russell Drago, you know, made my mind up for me. So I came to Illinois, to Urbana, and at the um, new student orientation they had for uh, incoming uh, chemistry students, I talked to the older grad students and they came up and asked me, who do you wanna work for? Who are you thinking of? And I said, Professor Drago. Well, little did I know, <laughs> every single one of them told me, don't you realize he doesn't take women? And I had no idea, but this goes to show you, you know, it didn't phase me. I decided in spite of everyone, everyone telling me he wouldn't take me, I went to go see him. And luckily he said to me, don't believe everything you've heard. I welcome you to my group. And so the good thing is I, I joined this big group of over 20 guys and that didn't bother me. I just did my chemistry and I got along with all the guys and all the, and Professor Drago. I mean, another woman did try after me, but apparently she didn't get along with Professor Drago because she decided to leave with a master's. But anyway, it worked out well. And I ended up being his second woman, but his 65th PhD. And he had always large research groups with postdocs. And so it, it was a, and actually you talk about networking. It was a good group to network with the Drago group. Well, then after um, graduate school, I had to decide, do I wanna stay in academia or go into industry? And at that time, it was 1976 when I got my PhD. 
Um, although I had enjoyed teaching and was an outstanding TA the year that I taught general chemistry, I actually started getting um, offers by going on interview trips because the campus recruiter, you know, immediately I got a, a number of interviews and I guess it was a good time then because I got um, job offers all over the country in chemistry in, in, uh, with my PhD from Drago. And I was very um, so excited because it was so different from anything I knew. I actually come from a family of professors, my father, all my siblings are professors, my cousins, my uncles. But so I was familiar with academics, but at that time, I, I know I would have had to do a postdoc, but I didn't pursue it because I ended up having such exciting job offers in industry. And at that time, it was really fantastic to do research in central research for uh, some of the big chemical companies. And that's what I did. I ended up taking the offer from Dow Chemical. And at first, the end of a day of interviews, they gave me the job offer in Midland, Michigan but I actually had done my homework, which is what I always advise students to do your homework before you go on your interview. I'm still a very active career consultant for ACS, but um, I said to them at the end of the day when they offered me the job, oh, I know you have a central research lab in the West Coast out near San Francisco. Would it be possible for me to visit them as well? And I was again, it was wonderful. I asked and they said yes. So they flew me out to San Francisco and I interviewed all day in the Walnut Creek lab and they did, they offered me a job as well. So then I had to decide between Midland or, or Walnut Creek, which is in the East Bay, right near Berkeley, actually, not too far from Berkeley. And um, of course you heard from both sides, you know, Corporate said, you have to work for corporate. And Walnut Creek, the Western division said, no, it's fine here in the West. So I ended up deciding because I had purposely, having been born in Pasadena, and I, I had actually had spent my, um, I remember growing up in on the beaches of Santa Monica, because my father spent every year consulting in the summer for Rand in Santa Monica. So I had always determined that once I got my PhD, I wanted to go back to California. So that's what I did. Now I went way too long on the Dow chemical thing, but basically I had a fabulous career. I worked for Dow in the 1970s, the 1980s and the 1990s, early 1990s. And I had a fabulous time in many different areas. That's the exciting thing about industry. There were so many different exciting research projects where you felt like you could be helping society and, and take a look quickly at the different areas that I got to work in. And I enjoyed them all. And Dow was always very good to me. When my husband, who was an electrical engineer by training from Stanford, decided to go back East to, um, to get an MBA from Harvard, Dow transferred me to their Central Research New England lab. Now, this is another change that people who work at Dow now, now didn't know, but Dow used to have great central research labs, not only in the headquarters, but on the two coasts because they wanted to recruit top talent from the top universities in the East and the West. And so, and they also had one in Granville, Ohio. So I had worked in all the different research areas for Dow. And um, I was very lucky because they were still there when they could transfer me. So I had a fantastic time in the New England lab. And then at the end, again, my husband and I, because I'd gotten married after I um, you know, settled in California. And basically we uh, had to decide you know, which job offer. It's always been a dual career um, journey for the two of us. And the most important advice I give to young women starting on a career is you need to have a supportive spouse, a partner for life.
that will support you, which is what my husband has done. Anyway, in, um, I, we did decide finally, very analytically uh, choosing whether, because we love both San Francisco and Boston, had good job offers in both. I had had, but I decided to go back to Dow in the West Coast and had a fabulous time in, in actually not only central research, which was in Walnut Creek, but in the Western division, which is close by um, in uh, Pittsburgh. So the um, areas that I worked in, membranes and polymers, um, plastics recycling, and that's another thing about Dow and companies are different. At that time, Dow really did not encourage their scientists to publish outside. I did a lot of internal reporting all the time. And that's how I got known within the company because while I was doing the first research on how to recycle plastics in the eighties, Dow Plastics you know, found out about me and recruited me to join them. So I went on loan for a couple of years and actually had a very exciting um, time learning and working with sales and marketing. And that's where I learned, I got a lot of training on because Dow, it was the plastics versus um, paper battle, which is still going on today. But it was the beginning of the, um, from plastics, we were, I was part of a program called Partners for Environmental Progress. And they were going to have us all be environmental ambassadors. And I forgot to mention that I actually was always the external research liaison, no matter which project we worked on. You know, first one being on electric batteries, I got to go visit and represent Dow Research with the Electric Power Research Institute. And with Dow Plastics, they, um, you know, at first we're thinking of having us three, three people, myself in San Francisco, I had counterparts in uh, New York City and in Chicago, but we basically were going to be called um, environmental ambassadors. They finally decided that we'd be called environmental advisors. But basically I got to work on with the top customers and forge strategic alliances with all the stakeholders in this uh, plastics. You know, we worked on uh, communicating reduce, the three R's, reduce, reuse, and recycle, that type of thing. So it was a very interesting time in my life. And in the end, what happened was I was part of a group uh, uh, the Western Division Research and Central Research together. Uh, half of the half of it was agricultural chemicals, and the other half was polymers and membranes, which I was a part of. And the ag people, their business was going great in their research, and they wanted to expand. They had great field test stations with UC Davis, but California did not want Dow to expand in California. So when they when corporate finally decided that they would they couldn't they couldn't expand, so they ended up moving half of the research over to Indianapolis. And Dow Agro is still doing fine. Um, and meanwhile, most of the people at uh, Dow Chemical in the West and research decided to do other things and leave. It took me only one weekend thinking about it. As much as I love Dow, on Monday I came in after the announcement and uh, I was quoted in the local newspaper because Dow was a big thing in our local area. And I just said, some of us are part of dual career families and I'm not free to move. My husband is not a chemist. He's not gonna wanna work in Midland or Freeport, Texas. So I went on and reinvented myself. In the, the latter part of my career. So I became, I, I then worked in a number of areas and this is where it's a good thing I had already been networking. You need to build your network, you know, throughout your career because when you need it, it's very helpful. So once word got out that I had left Dow, a CEO of a small 
instrumentation company came up to me and said, why don't you come interview at my company? We could use a PhD polymer chemist. And so I interviewed at March Instruments and had a couple of very interesting years seeing the difference between a small company of about 100 people and a huge company like Dow Chemical. Uh, you learn to do a lot of things for yourself in a small company and don't have quite all the resources like at Big Dow. But it was still very interesting and exciting. And I got to go um, when that, whenever the CEO, a salesperson, he brought me as the technical person to go um, to conferences. And we were, um, you know, as vendors, we were uh, selling these high energy plasma instrumentation instruments. So anyway, what happened is then after a couple of years, this small company got acquired by a larger company, which happens a lot, and then totally changed directions. So one of the other PhD chemists uh, at this smaller company and I decided to leave and found a, our own little startup. I was the president and he was the chief technology officer, but basically, and we had a lawyer working with us because we were still trying to get patent protection in this area of polymer surface modifications. But unfortunately, he developed health issues and I, I definitely know through vicariously that it is not easy with startups. Um, you need to have the funding. Anyway, I, I do know because my husband is always, has been a serial entrepreneur these last number of years. But anyway, um, the area that I then founded and had the most satisfaction was Sciences Fund. And it was really my own small family business where I got to teach young students and show them how much fun science can be. It was not just chemistry, it was all kinds of science for little kids. And I started doing that because my daughter came home one day and she was maybe just starting, well, just finishing up elementary school, but she came home one day and said, gosh, mom, I think science is so boring, which is kind of shocking to a parent to hear that. So I decided to go do something. And that's what I did. I started in the community, uh, just teaching after school and during the summer, full-time summer camps and that, that type of thing. It was not around back then when I was doing it. And I also worked hard to do more outreach to promote science education and funding for these schools. So here now, let me turn to my progression within the American Chemical Society. I actually often confuse ACS and Dow because they were both such huge parts of my life. Anyway, I have been a member now, it actually it is 50 years since I joined uh, ACS as a young grad student, as soon as I started grad school to get the journals, JAX and um, inorganic chemistry. But so the first 20 years, I was really a research scientist and then uh, luckily, before I left Dow, I started getting involved with my local section. Now, I mentioned there are all these sections across the country, and I know you have one here. Everybody has a local section not too far away in our country. So it's a way to get involved and get all kinds you know, of networking and uh, experiences to help you grow. So I started with the women chemists in the early 1990s. And I kept going because I liked it. I liked the people, I liked the programs, and then I started contributing. They asked me to come and chair the Women Chemists Committee after one year. And once you're on the chair of a committee, you are part of the executive committee for the local section. So I slowly climbed up and uh, learned more and got more involved with the local section. I then went on to National Chemistry Week which re really went along with my interest in helping young children um, learn the fun of chemistry and science. So the other things I did here, the public relations, career assistance, and government affairs all came along later because as I'll see, show you in the next slide, my progression within the national level of the ACS um, helped me bring back resources 
to my local section, the California section. And I had the great honor of chairing my local California section during our centennial back in 2001. And I will mention we have, we've had several, we, to this day, our NCW coordinator today still does family science nights, but we had our first one back in 1997. And unfortunately we no longer do this, but I will say it is such a thrill to go out on the football fields of UC Berkeley during halftime to talk about National Chemistry Week and Seaborg because Glenn Seaborg, Nobel laureate, actually was the chancellor of UC Berkeley at one time. But it was 50,000 football fans. It was pretty cool doing that. Anyway, so I was elected a counselor for the California section back in 1995. And counselors are representatives of either a local section or a technical division. And so these are the people that represent, you know, the American Chemical Society. And so once you become a counselor, you can join um, national committees. And so these national committees is where I got a lot of um, resources, networking, um, learning leadership skills more. I'm currently on budget and finance, which for the entire society, which I love. And then these are other committees that I served on and learned and, and brought back um, resources. Uh, I, have, I have network uh, good colleagues all across the country. This is Committee on Public Relations and uh, Chemistry and Public Affairs got me into um, working with our legislators and the uh, funding agencies, local section activities. And then eventually I was able to chair, become chair of the Committee on Economic and Professional Affairs, which actually deals with career assistance for all our members. And then at that point, I had done all the work that I should have been nominated, I suppose, but I actually had to run by petition because people were starting to ask me to run for the board. And I ended up, but because I have a good network and I knew lots of people, I actually got enough petition signatures to run for the board the first time in, uh, and got elected. I've actually, actually, I guess I, I ran for student council when I was in high school and I've actually run, every time I've run, luckily I've won. And so I actually got on the board and that was quite a change. At that time, there was just no diversity on the board but it's slowly changing. And I'm very happy to say that the ACS board has many more, has much more diversity now. And I then after two terms on the board, I decided to run instead of a third term, which I could, I decided to run for president because I'd already seen enough and learned enough and knew enough of what I wanted to accomplish and what my vision was for ACS that I decided to do what was the impossible. I mean, at that time, um, I decided to run for the board. And basically, I again, I, I probably need to quickly go on. I'll, 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 I'll share it at the end when I have time about some of the obstacles. Why get involved? Well, as I've mentioned, it's definitely great for networking at any stage in your life. If you have a good network, you can, you know, get introductions, get help. But career wise, you know, making moves, whether you're within your company or out of your company and moving on to different career transitions, and definitely for leadership opportunities. The ACS has a lot of different courses that are offered. And a lot of it is in leadership and how to be a good leader. Um, improving science education, that's something I've been very passionate about for many years. And I also think it's so important today, especially to improve the science literacy of the general public. And that's why we need to combat this chemophobia and misperceptions. And now today there's all this disinformation. So I think it's important for us scientists to step up and you know, help to address some of these misperceptions. 
I do feel that we also have a duty to help educate our policy and decision makers at all levels, you know, um, city, state, national. And I actually, that was that government affairs committee I mentioned locally. I used to bring years ago, I brought a group of chemists to visit Nancy Pelosi's office because I wanted to get better funding for education for the, uh, the school, the younger, the students, high school, be younger students. And then later, you know, I went to Washington DC to talk to NIH, DOE to get more funding for research for our scientists. But I think it's important to be able to help educate the people who make the decisions in policy. And these last number of years, I really believe it's time to give back to our profession and society, which is what I've been doing. And especially for, these, uh, for this AAPI event, I think it's important to have a unified collective voice so that we can make a difference. And that's something I feel that we can all work on because celebrating diversity, no matter which culture or which country you're from is something that adds to, enriches the discussion. So once I got on the board, you get, as a board member, you're allowed to write two ACS comments a year. And the comments are in our weekly chemical and engineering newsletter. And actually over the years, I've seen, I've actually written 27 comments over these last number of years because I had things I wanted to say and I wanted to share. So if you ever go um, on the website, you can do a search and see some of these things. But I talked about how chemistry ambassadors can go global because I had felt for many years, and actually when I was chair of SEPA, I actually also talked about this, that ACS can work with global partners as ambassadors to help improve and advance science, technology, and education in the world. And so it was almost impossible, I'll tell you, because it um, actually what you have to do to run for president, the nominations and elections committee has to come to you and you have no idea who you're going to run against because that might scare some people and they wouldn't want to do it. But the year they, that I ran, which I was, um, nominations elections did by then, you know, nominate me, but they did something I doubt if they'll ever do again, because what they did is they put four board members running against each other. So that's really something very unexpected. And you also have to do town hall debates in front of all the counselors, to hear what you have to say, and then do speeches in front of the 400, 500 counselors. Um, and you each have three minutes to give a speech. And then the, the counselors decide, they pick two out of four people to run for president each year. That's how it works. And the year I was running, right before the town hall debate, an older white gentleman, a counselor, I won't, came up to me and says to me, I was up on stage and right before we're about to start the town hall debate, he goes, Marinda, you don't have a chance. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a mean thing to say, just as I'm up ready to do a debate, but I showed them. I didn't let it phase me. I did fine. And then later he came back and said, maybe you have a chance <laughs> because the other three board members were really wonderful people, all my senior. So it was kind of an amazing thing that I actually became president. Um, but I really wanted to champion diversity and inclusivity. At that time, it was just DNI. And in these last few years since then, they've now added respect, which is important, and equity most recently in last, just a few months ago, they added the um, equity, but also collaborating to enhance the global chemistry enterprise. So ACS started on the road of becoming much more global at that point. And these last eight years, we've made tremendous advances, but working for our members was always extremely important to me. 
So I worked very hard those three years in the ACS presidential discussion. So domestic, I mean, I was invited to all, all the stars recommended, I mean, sh uh, show all the places I went because I was invited to give talks. And I don't have time now to go into the National Historic Chemical Landmark dedications, but I will say that I'm very proud that the building behind me, Noise Lab on your campus, actually got the first National Historic Chemical Landmark for any chemistry department in the country. Anyway, for international outreach, I also worked very hard to build and strengthen relationships. In that period of time, we started, ACS started signing regional alliances. So we signed an alliance with the um, South African Chemical Society, anyway, different chemical societies. And I went, the red stars are all the places that I was invited to visit. And the blue stars are all represent the leaders that I met and then invited to visit us at an ACS meeting. And I asked them all to give talks. So um, I've tried to share a lot of this knowledge. I don't have time to go into details, but it's an amazing, um, very, I hope to be able to share more of this with you. As soon as I became president, I actually invited the presidents. I got 12 presidents of chemical societies from around the world to come to one of our national ACS meetings. In 2013, we were in New Orleans. So I had presidents, let's see, the one, we have, well, Europe, Asia, um, Africa. And in Asia, we have, you know, the presidents of China and Taiwan, Japan and Korea. But these that would have to do with the Asian, the Asian American Pacific Islander theme. But all these other, I hope you can see this on your, can you see the full list? Because mine is filled with uh, people. <laughs> yeah, we can see, we can see it. <laughs> okay, good. Anyway, so now let's see, I'm gonna wrap up soon. I ended up working hard those three years and we, gave, um, we organized, I worked a lot with H.N. Cheng, who's now the president. He and I were pretty much, there was a handful of Chinese or, or Asian, I mean, as, as uh, Asian counselors at all for many years. But now I'm very happy to see a few more uh, actually getting active, you know, leaders in the technical divisions and local sections. But these books, just go to this website. It's the ACS website, the publications. And if you put in my name, Marinda Wu, you'll come up with these three books where I try to share information that is still valuable to young people who are trying to figure out their careers. The second book um, has careers, all different kinds of careers for people who are in chemistry. And Succeeding, the first book has thought leaders in, from top well-known professors um, and well-known well um, leaders at the big companies. Anyway, they're in there. And then the third book is also on jobs. And of course, I highlighted diversity in the second book. But you can take a look because as an ACS member, you can actually get um, a number of chapters for free. So leadership is a skill. And according to the dictionary, it's the ability to guide, direct, or influence. And most of these skills have to be learned. And you, as if you get involved with an organization like ACS, uh, a lot of it's volunteer work, you can get the opportunity to uh, strengthen those skills with experiences. And there's also training, as I mentioned. And Bill Gates said, leaders are those who empower others. So I'm still working on trying to empower others. And that's a, that's a lifelong you know, journey for all of us. So I'm going to end now with a few life lessons learned. As you can see there, my life, I mean, destiny played a huge part, but determination is something I've always had. You know, you can't imagine how many times people will come to me and say, you can't do that. And I go, why not? And then you show them how to do it because people are used to doing things a certain way. But if you're 
if you stand up and you say, there's another way to do it, get people thinking. And that's why I think diversity is so great because then you get different voices and different thoughts and you can come up with more innovative solutions. And it's absolutely necessary to have confidence in yourself and the courage to stand up. Um, again, during q and I'll go into the story of, of uh, other things anyway. I think, I hope I mentioned some of this today. Uh, passion and perseverance are something I truly believe in. And it was actually a common theme for the 16 global women leaders that I invited for a women chemist symposium a number of years ago um, to keep going in spite of all the obstacles. Excellence is something I've always um, believed in. I won't take a job or responsibility unless I know I can do an excellent job. And equity, as I said, I am so glad that ACS is now promoting as a core value equity. So it's D-E-I-R, diversity, equity, inclusivity, and respect. Because I do feel that if we work together with global partners or local partners, you can, we can all achieve more progress and prosperity. So I'll end with a quote from my favorite philosopher, Confucius, who lived such a long time ago, 500 BC. He said, choose a job you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life. And wherever you go, go with all your heart. I've always believed in things like that. When I gave my valedictorian speech from high school, it was the title was a time for work and a time for play. And I've always believed in that. You know, I do everything, you know, 100%. <laughs> so I'll end and show you my wonderful family. You need to have the support of your family if you're going to have a successful career and happy life, which I do. And this is at my daughter's PhD graduation. She's got a wonderful husband. They were Stanford classmates and my son is doing, they're all doing very well. He's much younger, so he's not yet married. And I've got a little granddaughter who is only four, but they're all, it's going to be an amazing world for her. And I hope we all make it a better world. And here is a photo of my dear mother. I was lucky that she, we celebrated her hundredth birthday with lots of relatives. She's got seven grandchildren and 10 great grandchildren. And we did this all before the pandemic. So she was, um, you know, a real pioneer. And her mentor, her, her mentor, or her role model was Marie Curie, which I'll tell you, it, it may be in Q&A, that was the most exciting thing to visit the Polish Chemical Society, which is in held, which is in the home of Marie Curie, Maria Szlodowska Curie, because she's actually Polish. All right, so that's it now. If I've <laughs> gone through most of the slides, I can happy to share 